Take heart and protect them well. Good, you're here. You haven't eaten yet, have you? We've bought quite a spread if you're interested. Only the finest dining from the last stand. Lest you wonder, we invited Astinian as well. But he refused with a rather grim-faced, No, thank you. I suspect Charlian cuisine is not to his liking. <laughs> oh, I don't know about that. Perhaps our lone wolf just needed some time apart. What, to perfect his brooding stare? Next time, I'll drag him out by the ear, sit him down in front of a Charlian feast, and see that he eats every last bite. An excellent idea. Of all people, warriors must take proper meals and rest, if they are to maintain a healthy constitution. Poor Astinian, beset on all sides. Speaking of one's physical condition, Mistress Kryle, I hear you recently played literal host to Heidelin herself. Ah, and what an experience that was. Tiring, yes, but no lasting harm done. If anything, I should have liked to speak with her longer. I've not felt a hint of her presence since. Heidelin instructed you to carry that flower, yes? Twill be your guide, test and proof of your conviction. And then something about seeking joy in darkness, was it? Come to think of it, isn't that what happened with Nidana back in Radzat Han? Hmm. The flower did seem to radiate a joyful glow, as if reflecting the elation we all felt. The relief of a people with renewed hope. Indeed. And in turn, I felt buoyed by that radiance. It was akin to spotting a beacon and knowing we were on the right path. I know we've not yet triumphed over the Tlophoroi, or learned the full breadth of the Forum's plans. But even within the midst of our struggles, we find small moments of joy to sustain us. Rare and hard won perhaps, but it is this pursuit of happiness that gives us the strength to carry on day after day. Hey, that's mine. To the swift the spoils. Though I recall that levitation spell of yours was quick enough. Mm, only barely. And even at my best, I'm still too slow to wield it effectively in battle. Mayhap I simply require more practice with this new magic. You unearthed it from the depths of Numenon, I presume? Aye, and from a veritable mountain of arcane tomes at that. T'was necessary to facilitate my solitary explorations. Or 
To put it simply, you used it to sneak around the Forbidden Archives. I... Uh, yes. Well, after a fashion. The shelves, they're too tall for me. And I could hardly move the library's platforms without attracting attention now, could I? Oh! oh. I'm not that ambitious. But it is pleasant to idle away the hours every once in a while. Enjoying the bracing cold, I see. Do you not own a warm coat or a cloak? Something in fur? Or fashioned from the skins of your enemies? Or... Well, never mind that. I come to you once more as the bearer of bad news. Our tower in Thavnir has been toppled. And I need not tell you by whom. Given how many we have at our disposal, the loss of a single spire is hardly fatal to our plans. It does, however, slow the rate at which we siphon the ether. If they continue to preoccupy themselves with the towers, then all will be well. But should our foe prove bold enough to strike at us here, then the timing becomes... Questionable. Our foe is bold enough. Of that, I can assure you. Ah, uh, yes. Very well, then. I suppose I must prepare a proper welcome. Honestly. Talk of your nemesis is the only thing you seem to enjoy. Does nothing else spark your interest? Hmm... No. All else is... equal. Equally tedious. Equally disappointing. The world is a tepid bog into which we sink, too weak to thrash as the mud clings to our eyes and fills our throats till we blissfully choke. But then came the light, blinding and pure and hot, so very hot, enough to set my soul aflame. I basked in the afterglow, until the void yawned once more, and then I knew the muck would never claim me again. There was naught for me ahead, so I drew the curtain on all that had come before. Burn, burn, 
Let the whole star burn. I will have my contest. I will reclaim my moment. How wonderful that the emptiness of death has not dissuaded you from committing your life to its pursuit once more. I don't know whether to envy you or pity you. You question my disinterest, but what of yours? Despite your noisome antics, I sense you take little pleasure in this endeavor. Mercy, my lord. Such pointed barbs from one who barely acknowledges my existence. Nevertheless, you are mistaken. For I do find this part somewhat enjoyable. You see, when I was mortal, I would always have the same dream. It was a fragmented thing. Disjointed. All the faces incomplete. The setting, too, was unknown to me. So I thought it simply a fantasy of my sleeping mind. Until one day, I realized it was showing me the truth. Much as your dream of the final days enlightened you, And soon, very soon, the rest of the world will see the truth of my dream, too. Yes, I think that is something we can both enjoy.
Ah, I remember you. I pray we have not caught you at an inopportune moment. We wanted to offer our thanks for your kind words in the forum. Well, I could hardly let that Inquisition go unchallenged. I've always believed that curiosity should be nurtured, not stifled. Thankfully, a majority of my colleagues agreed. A slender majority, aye, but a majority nonetheless. Had the vote not gone our way, we would be having a very different conversation, if any at all. Though I'd like to think you would have not given up on our cause. I'm told you paid a visit to the Annex afterwards. Yes, that's right. I was hoping to speak with the grandchildren of my dearly departed friends Gallif and Louisois in a less doer setting. But it seems I just missed you. I still can't believe how much you've grown. If only your grandsires could have seen the way you presented yourselves to the Forum. Why, it fair brought a tear to my own eye. You must have the patience of a saint, putting up with this lot and their antics. Never mind Matoya's prize student. Luckily, I know a thing or two about managing unruly younglings. If you ever need advice, don't hesitate to ask. If I may, there is a rather more pressing matter we wish to discuss. What can you tell us of this duty that the Forum must fulfill? Nothing, I'm afraid. Like all humble servants of the Forum, I am sworn to secrecy. Or rather, I couldn't tell you if I tried. Our duty is of the gravest importance. Furthermore, if the particulars were made public, it would incite widespread panic. As such, those entrusted with this duty have been bound by an enchantment, which prevents us from speaking of such matters without the express permission of the Forum. How is that even possible? <laughs> It's been some time since I last gave a lecture. Please, take a seat. We shall begin by reviewing the fundamentals of etherology. The ether, which imbues us with life, can be categorized into three forms. Two are of the incorporeal sort, the soul and the memory. Can anyone tell me the third? Yes, very good. This is the form with which the layman is most familiar. Consumed by even the simplest of daily activities and replenished by the food and drink that sustain us, this form of ether is in constant flux. In contrast, the ether that comprises the soul is rarely subject to dramatic change. The same can be said for memory, as the two are intrinsically linked.
Picture the soul as paper and memories as words written upon it. Now, what would happen if that paper was doused with ink, the same type of ether as comprises the memories? It would blot out everything that was written. Precisely. We would be unable to recall the memories, and any activities that depend upon them would be hindered as well. In fact, this exact phenomenon was observed on a vast scale not so long ago. And what might that have been? The Seventh Umbral Calamity. The people of Eorzea vividly recall Bahamut breaking free of the Lesser Moon and raining hellfire down upon the realm. But no one could seem to remember the events that followed immediately afterwards. Indeed, to this day we have yet to determine whether it was an unintended consequence or a deliberate act. The enchantment which binds me and the rest of the Forum is based on a similar principle. And yes, it is a contravention of the Charlene prohibition against the practice of memory manipulation. Only when a new member is inducted and told of our great duty are they subjected to the process. A necessary evil. You have my word that it would never be used to manipulate the populace. I should hope not. But can this enchantment be dispelled and your memories restored? If nine-tenths of our members give their approval, then the process may be reversed. Then, and only then, would we be able to speak freely to others of our sacred duty. Barring that, we must wait until we return to the Ethereal Sea. For there we will be purified, the blots upon our souls washed clean. and our memories drift apart and dissolve. Rather defeating the purpose, I suppose. But there are those memories that are indelibly etched upon our souls, some believe. What happens after that? We are reduced to pure ether, coalesce with that of others, and create souls anew. Alternative schools of thought assert souls remain whole and return to the corporeal world, reborn into another form. Both theories have their proponents. Personally, I consider each equally probable. Well, I think that's enough education for today, now that I've given you some food for thought. Or rather, an entire banquet. I would remind you that although I'm unable to assist you with certain matters, the resources at my disposal may still be of use to you. I'll arrange for you all to be given the run of Phenomenon. 
Of course, as associate to our alumni and the students of Baldessian, this privilege is extended to you as well, my friend. Oh, and I suggest you speak with Ki Aliapo. She's well known among the artisans of Charlian, and her network of contacts may prove useful in your search for knowledge. I wish you all the best in your pursuits, wheresoever they may take you. <laughs>